welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV, and this is part three of chapter seven of Becoming Supernatural by Dr. Joe Dispenza. So once the heart center is activated, it acts as an amplifier to jumpstart the brain, enhance its activity, and create balance, order, and coherence throughout the body. Living heart centered. As I said earlier, every thought you think produces corresponding chemistry equal to that thought which in turn creates an emotion. Therefore, you're suggestible only to the thoughts equal to your emotional state. We now know that when our students are heart-centered and feel more wholeness and oneness, they're less separate from their dreams. When they feel gratitude, abundance, freedom, or love, or all of those emotions, welcome corresponding thoughts. Those heart-centered emotions open the door to the subconscious mind so that you can program your autonomic nervous system equal to the thoughts of your new future. We also know that if they live in the feeling of fear or lack, but try to think they're abundant, they can't produce a measurable effect because change can only happen when thoughts are in alignment with the emotional state of the body. They can think positively all they want, but without a corresponding feeling or emotion equal to that thought, the message cannot be felt or understood throughout the rest of the body. So you could repeat the affirmation, I am fearless, until you're blue in the face, but if it's fear you're actually feeling, the thought, I am fearless, never makes it past the brainstem, which means you're not signaling the body and the ANS into a new specific destiny. The feeling is what produces the emotional charge, energy, to stimulate your autonomic nervous system into a different destiny. Without the feeling, a disconnect remains between your brain and body, between the thought of health and the feeling of health. And you can't embody that new state of being. It's only when you change your energy that you can produce more consistent effects. If you sustain these elevated emotions on a daily basis, eventually your body in its innate intelligence begins to make relative genetic changes in the way I described earlier. That's because the body believes that the emotion you are embracing is coming from an experience in your environment. So when you open your heart center, practicing feeling and emotion, before the experience occurs and marry it with a clear intention, the body responds as if it's in the future experience and the heart-mind coherence then influences your body chemistry and energy in a series of ways. So if coherence between the heart and the brain can originate in the heart and their synchronization results in optimal performance and health, then you should be taking time every day to focus on activating your heart center by intentionally choosing to feel the elevated emotions of a heart rather than waiting for something outside of yourself to elicit those emotions. You become who you are truly meant to be, a heart-empowered individual. When you are living by the heart, you naturally choose love and innately demonstrate it through compassion and care for the well-being of yourself, others, and planet Earth. Through our partnership with HMI, our students have demonstrated that with practice, we can in fact produce, regulate, and sustain elevated feelings and emotions, independent of events in our external world. In our workshops around the world, through the practice of regulating heart rhythms to sustain elevated emotions, we teach our students how to generate heart and brain coherence. We then measure their abilities using HRV monitors. During guided meditations, we ask our students to surrender to the feelings of gratitude, joy, and love, and we encourage daily practice outside of our formal instruction because when one chooses to practice sitting in a state of coherence, it becomes a habit. I hope that with enough practice, our students practice, our students can replace old mental scripts of feeling unworthy, fearful, or insecure with more elevated states of being and falling deeply in love with their lives. We've seen enough of them demonstrate that it is indeed possible to produce positive 
measurable, tangible effects in their lives simply by shifting the paradigm of their thoughts and feelings. These dedicated individuals return to their homes where the positive effects they've produced in their own lives ripple out to the positively affect their families and communities, continuously expanding their vibrational influence of harmony and coherence throughout the world. By repeatedly practicing the regulation of heightened emotional states in time, the constant feeling of elevated emotion creates a new emotional baseline. This baseline then begins to continuously influence a new set of thoughts equal to the heightened feelings. And the summation of those novel thoughts creates a new level of mind, which then produces more corresponding emotions equal to those thoughts, further sustaining that baseline. So when this feedback loop between the heart, body, and mind, brain, occurs, you are in an entirely new state of being. The new consciousness of the unlimited mind and the energy of profound love and gratitude. The repetition of this process is what it means to recondition your body, rewire your brain, and reconfigure your biology equal to your new state of being. So now you are naturally, automatically, and regularly broadcasting a different electromagnetic signature of energy into the field. This is who you are or who you have become. Countless history books could be written through the lens of incoherent emotions. Whether the result is a Shakespearean tragedy, genocide, or a world war, survival emotions such as blame, hate, rage, competition, and retribution have resulted in an endless, unnecessary trail of pain, suffering, oppression, and death. I'm going to pause here. My best friend's son says, hey, don't don't make me jump on your train of pain. And this is what it's talking about, an unnecessary trail of pain, suffering, oppression, and death. So the results have caused humans to live in opposition and conflict rather than in peace and in harmony. I'm going to hit the pause button again here. I want you to think back to not only the last 10 or 20 years of your life, but I want you to think back to your childhood Do you see a reoccurring pattern of disharmony, of unnecessary trails of pain, suffering, oppression, and death, unnecessary abuse, Uh, unnecessary, there's a time when, you know, as a child, when you're up until you're 18 years of age, you know, you don't have any choice. You have to live with whatever set of parents you were brought into this world with. But once you're 18 and you're an adult, you have the wherewithal to make the choice to either continue living under you know, the provision of their roof or to, as an adult, 18 years and up, you can choose to live your own life and make your own rules and have your own housing and make your own decisions independent of what mommy and daddy says. So are you choosing to take that route or are you choosing to, in a sense, prostitute yourself and subject yourself under an abuse which by your own admission, is unacceptable for the trade-off of having free room and board or the trade-off of perhaps having that narcissistic supply of that energy vampirism because perhaps you may not want to admit to yourself that you have an addiction to that energetic interplay because you haven't really truly learned the lesson yet to go within to get that energy source So instead, you subject yourself under a set of of circumstances. It could be going back under your parents' roof. It could be subjecting yourself to a relationship where that type of emotional, perhaps physical, but emotional, financial, spiritual abuse is taking place where that party is constantly triggering you and you're allowing them to constantly trigger you because that is the way they receive energy is by triggering you. There may not be an argument there, but gosh darn it, they're going to make sure they create an argument because that will incite your energy surge, which is the energy that they want to leach off of you. If that's the case, that's something to look at. 
And you may need to decide, am I gonna continue with this addictive behavioral pattern where I victimize and subject myself to this place? Whether you are the perpetrator, whether you're the victim or the perpetrator, it makes no difference. You have to take responsibility for the energy that you bring into a situation and what you allow into your space. Take a cr real close look at that because I think if you're really taking time to be honest with yourself, you will see reoccurring patterns that don't feel good and that do not serve you and that do in fact create incredible energy leaks because the truth and the reality is, my friend, that the energy that you're seeking isn't outside of you. It's inside of you that you need to go. That infinite well, that infinite source is within you. When you get right with you and you learn to have heart and brain coherence and you learn to tap into that 5D quantum realm, you will no longer need to be triggering people if you're the perpetrator victimizing somebody and trying to instigate a fight where really there is no fight. Or you won't subject yourself under being under the thumb of someone who is trying to trigger you so that they can get their energetic supply and they can vampire that energy and suck it out of you just to make themselves feel better. Because some interaction is better than no interaction in their case. In that case, the moment that you wake up and you decide, oh my gosh, I had no idea that this is what was happening in my life, no more. And more often than not, you're going to realize that you have more than one place where that type of relationship has been existing in your life. And when you do, and you start to close those loops and you start to close those energy leaks, you'll have more energy to be, do, and have the purpose for which you were put on this planet for. You'll be able to be the love. So you're no longer seeking the love because you know that you are the love. And because we are mirrors, that the world reflects back to you that which you are. Once you are no longer that victim, no, you are no longer that perpetrator. Now, because you are the love, you are so in love with yourself. You are so in love with life. Guess what? People who are whole like you begin to show up in your life. And it usually manifests in the form of, I'm going to call it the 50 shades of gray. It's the 50 shades of love. Because people who are whole in your experience will start to show up. You will still have, I'm going to call them the Klingons, the ones who are going to still cling on because they still, you know, the negative loves the positive. Remember, we live in a world of polarity. The negative likes the positive. The dark likes the likeness. The dark, I'm going to repeat that again, the dark likes the lightness. And so you will always have some small fragment, but the majority of your world will vastly change and you will start to be surrounded with people who love, appreciate, support, and respect you, not only in your personal life, but also in your business life, in your social life, and so it goes. Back to the book. The results have caused humans to live in opposition and conflict rather than in peace and harmony. This is a time in history when we can break that cycle. This is a pivotal moment in the story of humanity where ancient wisdom and modern science are intersecting to provide us with the technology and scientific understanding to learn not only how to more efficiently and effectively manage our emotions, but also what that means for our health, relationships, energy levels, and personal and collective evolution. It doesn't require moving mountains only changing our internal state of being. This allows us to alter the way we act with one another, replacing stressful situations with positive experiences that give us energy, fill our spirit, and leave us with a sense of wholeness, connection, and unity. The brain may think, but when you turn your heart into an instrument of perception, it knows. I'm going to pause here for a moment because in, earlier in this chapter and later in the book, Dr. Joe does elaborate more 
on the fact that each one of your energy centers and your heart center being your fourth energy center, each one of those has a brain center of its own. There's actually a nerve cluster in the heart that forms, I believe in the third week of gestation, when you are just an embryo, you're not even a fetus yet. Before your brain even forms, there is a neural network that is created that begins your heart, even in anticipation of creating the entire muscle mass of the heart. The brain of the heart starts first, and then the muscle mass grows around it. It's secondary to the heart brain that the physical brain in the skull is formed. And so that's something for you to note about. It's also a clue to you, a clue to us, a clue to me, that the heart brain is far more powerful than the brain that's sitting in between your left and right ear, the six inches you know, in your skull. So that begs to differ in the conventional wisdom that the critical analytical thinking mind is the ruler of all, that is the be all, do all, end all of everything that has, is, and ever will be. That is obviously not true because the brain in the heart is an instrument of perception. It knows. Have you ever had an instance where before something happened, you knew that it was going to happen? Did you ever have a premonition? It could have been two, three, four seconds before. It could have been two, three minutes before. It could have been two, three hours, two, three days, two, three weeks, or two, three months before that something good or something bad was going to happen. And then it came to pass and you knew, oh, I already knew this was going to happen. It's especially poignant when you see it happen, when you perceive something two, three seconds, two, three minutes before, two, three hours before, and then it happens and you recognize that that's what you were preconceiving your brain will go, oh, how did I know that that was going to happen? Especially if it's within seconds or minutes. You go, I already knew. How did I know that they were going to say that? How did I know? Well, it's because your heart knows. Your heart has a brain. And make no mistakes. Be rest assured. Know that you know that you know. Be aware that your heart is operating in 5D. So what does that mean? What is the benefit to you when you tune in, tap into this aspect of yourself and you can tune in to the knowingness to your heart, your heart, when it tunes in and when it is tapped into that 5D realm, it is not local. It is non-local. It can be bi-local. It can be multiverse local multiverse local. I'm going to repeat that again, multiverse local. So it can be in multiple dimensions at the same time. It can be in multiple, multiple dimensions and multiple universes, quantiverses, I'm going to say, at the same time. Quantiverses. I don't even know if that term exists. I don't know where that came from but that doesn't matter. I am here to let you know that our, what we came to learn and to master in this dimension of reality with these meat suits that were issued at birth is how to master our emotions and limits. And when we finally get it through our thick skulls that it's not about just the brain between the six inches in between our ears, but that it is about connecting this beautiful, red, blood-filled, life-giving pump that is so much more than a pump, but that this pump can pump you up. 
and pump you out into the stratosphere, into realms that you could not even begin to fathom, that whatever your mind can imagine and conceive, you can achieve and you can receive. But in order to do that, you need to connect with your heart. You need to get your heart and your brain coherent. You need to slow down your heart rate. You need to slow down your brain waves. You need to slow down your breath. You need to align your heart with your brain. Connect the two so that your heart gives the benefit of its knowingness and its ability to be non-local and quanti-local, quantiverse, whatever the term was that I said before, I don't even remember it because it wasn't from my memory that that came, I don't know where that came for, from, but nonetheless, you, you understand what I'm saying. Now, your brain is going to have the benefit of that. Now, as the dynamic duo come hand in hand together, now, you can truly begin to create. You can truly become the master of your own domain. You can become that great I am in all its glory and all its forms. And it's possible for you to create the impossible. So examples from our workshops. To see an example of how heart coherence creates brain coherence, take a look at graphics 8A and 8B in the color insert. The first image shows relatively low normal beta brainwave patterns before the person begins to create heart coherence. The second image shows a significant change once the person moves into sustained heart coherence just a few seconds later. That's because the heart acts as an amplifier to influence the brain to create very coherent synchronized alpha brainwaves. So in figure 7.3a and 7.3b, you will see an HRV analysis from one of our students taken at an advanced workshop. She is having a pretty amazing day. The first chart in figure 7.3a represents two meditations, one in the morning and one right before lunch, and each block represents five minutes of elapsed time. So where you see the first gray arrow on the top of the scan pointing down to the right is when she went into and sustained heart coherence. So during our 7 a.m. meditation, she maintained the state for more than 50 minutes until you see the second arrow pointing down to the left. At the bottom of the scan, where you see the second gray arrow pointing down to the right, is when she began or when she again went into heart coherence for 38 minutes during a meditation just before lunch. So again, she went into heart coherence for 38 minutes during a meditation just before lunch, ending with a second gray arrow pointing down to the left. You can see she is developing the skill. So each set of gray arrows pointing inward in both figures represent a student going into heart coherence by sustaining an elevated emotional state. Every square block represents a five minute interval. Both figures 7.3a and 7.3b. You can tell she's developing the skill to regulate her internal states. So in figure 7.3b, at the bottom where the two arrows are pointing inward, the student spontaneously goes into heart coherence for over an hour. Her body is being conditioned to a new mind. I'm going to stop right here because think about this. I want you to think about this because her body is being conditioned to a new mind. What does that mean? That means that finally, that person, you are finally successfully not only getting into heart coherence where you're opening up your heart, you're feeling that elevated emotion of love. Your heart is in a coherent state. Your heart is now perceiving, it's starting to feel, it's starting to know, it's starting to become more sensitive. And that energy is traveling now up to the brain. So now your heart and your brain are connected. Your brain is benefiting from the benefit of the energy of your heart and it's being conditioned into a new mind. And so the ways of the past, the habits of the past, the personality, the personal reality that you had of your old personality are now being left behind because now new neurological pathways are being carved in your brain and your brain is accepting this. Now you have 2,600 
new neurological networks that are forming and creating, linking and syncing together. You're becoming smarter. And you're firing and wiring in new and more effective ways instead of the 1300 Neuro parallel, you know, neurological pathways of the brain that you used as the habitual you, you are now the new reconditioned you, so you are far more intelligent. You have 2,600 neurological pathways of the brain that are firing and wiring and syncing together. You have more photons that are lit up. They're wiring and firing like crazy. You're lighting up like a Christmas tree. If we had an EEG hooked up to your brain, you would have a lot of energy coming out of your brain, not just out of your heart. That's why your brain is being conditioned to a new mind. Now the physical organ of the brain, the mechanical organ, is affecting the mind, therefore affecting the ego. It's like a domino effect. And now what that is telling you and what is settling in to also, your body now is that your brain is being reconditioned. So your free will and your awareness is now understanding, realizing, recognizing in the awareness that you are becoming the new you and you are creating your own, your own personal reality to reform, to reshape by your choice, your new personal reality and your new personality. So now look at figure 7.3b in the, in the next meditation. Later that afternoon, if you glance between the two gray arrows at the top of the figure, you can see that she goes into heart coherence again for almost 45 minutes. So what makes this reading so fascinating, however, is what happens later that evening around 8 p.m. So see the second set of gray arrows pointing inward? Since there was no meditation taking place at that time, this is fascinating. We asked her later what she had experienced. Her heart went into super coherence for more than an hour while she was in her normal level of wakefulness. So for more than an hour while she was in her normal level of wakefulness. Imagine if that happened to you. Can you imagine how exciting that would be for you? Imagine multiple spontaneous super coherence moments in time in your day, in your week. Can you imagine you have one or two of those a day, seven days a week? Now you have 14 to 21 of those a week. What would you do with all that extra joy, all that extra energy? Sounds to me like a much better way of living than how you've been living in the past. Wouldn't you agree? So she told us she'd been getting ready for bed when suddenly she felt an overwhelming feeling of love. It was so strong that she had to lie down and surrender to it. Oh, her heart spontaneously went into heart coherence and for an hour and 10 minutes while she lay on her bed, she felt deeply in love with her life. She sustained a change in her ANS. Where you see the last arrow is where she said she rolled over on her side and fell asleep. Not a bad way to end the day. Wouldn't you agree? Pause. I got to tell you, uh, this last Sunday, normally I don't do uh, these readings on Sundays. I figure, you know what, even God rested on the Sabbath, so Sunday is my Sabbath, and so I don't do the readings on a Sunday. So Sunday afternoon, I was going to go to the beach, and I was going to do some of that, but I had one of these super coherent, um, just joy and it was a real overwhelming feeling and I had this overwhelming feeling that I just needed to lay down and let whatever this feeling was just pass through my body and um, I didn't know that I was going to fall asleep. I thought I was just going to lie down for like 20-30 minutes and I'm the type of person I don't, I'm kind of odd in that I don't run out of energy. So it wasn't a running out of energy feeling. It was it's hard to explain what a super coherence feeling feels like, but when you have it, you're going to know. And so I just had this feeling that I just had to lay down. And so I just laid down and then I just had this overwhelming sense of calm and peace. And then somehow just fell in. I, I just kind of went kind of really deep into a very deep theta 
just, I just remember diving very deep and I wasn't meditating. That was the other thing. I did not intend to meditate. I intended to lay, just lay down for a little bit and just see what this feeling was about. And the next thing you knew, I was deep. And all I can say is that this is part of your path. This is part of your creating a new mind to recondition your body. This is part of your ascension. It's part of the process of creating your new experience of what you perceive to be earth. It's probably the best way I can language it. To be quite honest with you, I don't have an intellectual grip of all of this. I, like you, I'm just figuring it out day by day in every way as I go. Um, as I figure out new things, I try my best to express and share them with you so that you can glean and you can hopefully um, benefit from those things. And if it collapses some time frames for you so that it can expedite your, you know, expedite your growing process, you know, so be it. So moving on here, as an example of three students sustaining heart-centered emotions for 45 minutes, so ponder this, you know how easy it is to think a fearful or anxious thought about a future event that hasn't happened, and in your mind, emotionally embrace this fictional outcome over and over. That sounds exhausting to me, but that's what war awards do. That's what, I would imagine that's what People who have, who have repeated anxiety attacks, they must in order to have, the only way you can have an anxiety attack or have a panic disorder is if you are repeatedly on a loop of a negative thinking pattern where you're worrying about something bad happening to you. So make no mistakes. A lot of people who have diseases, in fact, if you are having, chances are, if you have some sort of neurological disorder, you probably have some sort of fear-based thought loop that's going in your head. I know, for, I know my son, when he was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre, he had a terrible um, germaphobic um, thought loop in his head that he couldn't get out of his head. He was fearful of so many things. It's like he's not the same person he was before GBS as opposed to after GBS. It's like night and day. The person, the person before, and he was a pretty happy-go-lucky kid before. He wasn't a negative kid on the outside. He had hidden, you know, from the inside, although he would show his germophobic ways, there's no question, but he was pretty much, um, he seemed to be a positive, upbeat person. However, inside his mind, in the deep recesses where, in the quiet places where only he knew where those thoughts were, he had a lot of fear. He had a lot of fear of germs. He had, he had a lot of, even though he never got sick, he had a lot of fear of illness. He had a lot of fears of safety. And long story short, when he had GBS, that completely catalyzed and transformed him over an 11 week period. And he came out like Superman, where he literally told me that he stared, he stared death in the face. And he said, well, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is that I can die. And he thought to himself, and he, you know, this is out of the mouth of an 11 year old. He's telling me this and he's saying, well, if I die, it's like, ah, that's not so bad. If I die, okay, yeah, I'll leave my family who I love, you know, for a short while, but I'll get to go, I'll be with Jesus. And before I know it, they'll all be with me. I'm getting a little emotional just sharing this with you all. So I apologize. Um, and then he said, he thought, well, and if he doesn't die, well, then it's fantastic because then that means that, you know, Jesus will heal him and that he'll be fine and he'll be bigger and stronger than he was before. And he said to me that uh, in that same moment, then it was revealed to him that he was going to get over this, that he was going to be bigger, stronger, and have more fun than he had ever had before. And he said, okay. And he said he didn't know how long. He didn't know exactly what that would entail. But he said he was fine with that. And he said he was, he was like cool with it. He was at peace with it. And it's like, okay, well, whatever I have to get through, you know, okay, it's good news. And this is not going to take me. I don't have to worry about, he wasn't really worried about death. 
he didn't think that death was such a bad option. So he was willing to move forward, grow, recuperate, heal, do whatever's never, whatever, whatever was necessary. And then it came to pass. And so if you are in that negative thinking loop, yeah, my mother-in-law, God bless her soul. She's one of the coolest people um, that I have known. She is such a giving person, has always been so giving for others. And God bless her. The, I, I could recognize some of the negative uh, thinking patterns that she had. And um, she's still with us, thank God. Um, but I remember um, um, some of the fearful expressions that she would share with me. And, you know, I, I always tried to help her the best I could. But, you know, she came down with shingles, no surprise, because she would worry about so many things that many of them never came to pass. But unfortunately, that negative thinking loop about worrying about A, B, C, D, and E, these five main things, um, of course, that wears and tears on your body. And, you know, I think when she came down with shingles, she was like in her mid to late 60s, and and um, she had a flurry of things that happened, and then, she, you know, she ended up having the shingles, and it's like, you know, ouch, that's you know, very, very painful in adults, uh, very unfortunate that she had to go through that. But it was an outward manifestation of an inward problem. No different than my son. He had an outward manifestation. It was a literal paralysis from the neck down. And it was evidence of an inward problem. So, and we all have that in different, in, to different degrees, because no one is devoid of fear. And it's not that you don't have fear. It's that you learn to manage the fear. You learn to recognize the fear. And you learn to recognize that if you have in your heart space, if you, if you have fear, if you have given the throne of your heart over to fear, then love cannot reside in the same place as fear. Those are dissonant energies. They are not coherent with each other. You either have heart coherence with love or you have heart incoherence with fear. It's one or the other. The science is very clear. If you look at the um, encephalographs and you look at the diagrams, if you look at the sound waves that are produced by the heart, sonograms, it is crystal clear. The, the two cannot coincide in the same space and time. It's impossible. So you have to ch choose to have courage. So what is courage? Courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. It's feeling the fear, being aware of the fear, and recognizing what that fear is trying to communicate to you, because it has a hidden message. The message is not always what you think it is. And you need to do the inner work to dive in deep and find out really what is it that is the core issue of that fear? What is the root stem that is giving birth to this fear? And when you open up your heart and you say, okay, I'm going to take a look at what this fear is. And now with courage, interestingly enough, the word courage, uh, if you, si vous parlez le français, if you speak French, courage, queer, queer, the word courage comes the French word queer. Coer is heart. So courage means to have heart. When you have heart, you are embracing the love in your heart. You recognize you are aware. You realize you understand the fear. You see the value that the fear has because it does have value. It's trying to communicate something to you, whether it's real or perceived doesn't matter, but it is there to show you something. It is biofeedback. Make no mistakes about that. This is not about taking the fear and stuffing it down, repressing, suppressing, eventually causing depression in yourself. No, that's not what this is about. This is about learning to manage that emotion of fear. Just like when I was on that 50 foot I-beam with the threat of losing my balance and falling off the I-beam. It's no different. 
and then having the courage to say, okay, no, I can't have these energy leaks now. What is the spirit trying to show me? You know, for me in that eye beam, it was, it was showing me self mastery. It was showing me that I was not fear, that I truly was love, that I truly had awareness and focus that I could manage, that I could take my free will. I could take my awareness and I could focus it in my heart that in that moment of fear, I could hit the stop button. I could hit that pause button, slow down my heart rate, slow down my breath, slow down my brain waves and create the desired outcome with which I wanted. Because when you have fear, you can't think. But now that I took mastery and control over those thoughts of fear and my body that was betraying me and it was shaking, it's my legs that were shaking. I was able to command that in a moment. It just took a moment to make that decision. I realized what that fear was trying to show me. And then I had to do it more than once because as you know, when I got to the other side, I was like, what? I had to do it again. I had to do it several times as I got over to the other side. And each time it got better. I realized there's no sense in arguing with myself over this. It's useless. It's wasteless. Why should I bother my time? It's like, no, my brain do as I say, I can do this. I am courage. I am love. I am in theta state. And if I can do it, you most certainly can do it. So fear is not our foe. Fear is our friend. Just like anyone who's ever harmed us, anyone who's ever betrayed us, anyone who's ever victimized us, anyone who's ever wronged us, anyone who's ever shortchanged us, anyone who's ever shamed us, anyone who has ever done anything that hurts our feelings, they've been a teacher. They have been put there to teach you something about you. And part of that lesson is that you are enough. You are enough. You are worthy. And your worth and your enoughness and your love doesn't come from anything outside. Just like sometimes there are people who try to make vast sums of money because they have a vast void inside their hearts. And they're trying to fill a God-sized hole in their heart with all this money. And it doesn't matter. There isn't any amount of money that's going to make them feel secure because that is something that they need to do an inward reach. The solution to all your problems, my friends, is an inward reach. It's getting heart and brain coherence. That's it. That's the secret. And some of you are going to hear this and you're not going to hear this. And I'm going to say, listen, 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 listen. This is the greatest jewel that you will ever find. And it is to get into heart and brain coherence, to learn how to love yourself, what that actually means. Do the work of taking your free will, your awareness, mastering your ego and your brain, using that fear, all of your emotions, the entire spectrum of your emotions are a guidance positioning system. Make no mistakes. It's like the GPS in your car. That is the GPS of your body, your emotions. You are not your emotions. When people say, I'm sad, bullshit. Pardon my French, but that's bullshit. That is a lie. You are not sad. You are not an emotion. You may be feeling sad. You may be feeling that emotion that you describe as sadness, but you are not sad. You are feeling sad. Those are two different things. One is saying that you are sad. The other one is saying that you are feeling the emotion of sadness. I'm angry. Well, to me, that seems like a bold faced lie because I know for a fact that you're not angry. You may be feeling anger, but you are not in fact anger. The entire world doesn't look to you and say, Oh, look, there's anger. No. Now you may be an angry person and they may say, Oh, wow. Look at him. 
Oh yeah, that's right. Stay away from him. He's a sangry, so you know, he's an angry SOB. You may embody, you may personify, you may behave angrily, but the entire planet doesn't say, oh yeah, he's anger. No, he's an angry man or she's an angry woman. I am bitter. No, you're not. Stop lying. Stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to me. Stop lying to the entire world. It's not true. Your, your emotions are there as biofeedback. They're there to show you the way. All of them, they're all valuable. So an example of three students sustaining heart-centered emotions for 45 minutes. So ponder this. You know how easy it is to think a fearful or anxious thought about a future event that hasn't happened and in your mind emotionally embrace this fict fictional outcome over and over. And you know how the more energy you feed the thought, the more you ruminate over other possible outcomes and eventually those thoughts deliver you to a worst case scenario. It's the emotions that are driving those thoughts. That's the gasoline, ladies and gentlemen. You've conditioned your body to be the mind in fear and anxiety. So if this continues over a long period of time, just like in Anna in chapter one, your body may have a panic attack, an autonomic, spontaneous bodily function that your conscious mind can't control. Pause. I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to have a panic attack or an anxiety attack. It must be God awful. However, if you find yourself in that situation, I've got to equate it to like when my legs were betraying me, hit the pause button and say, ah, I see what's happening here. This doesn't feel good. Any emotion, I don't care what, whether it's anxiety, panic attack, nervousness, sadness, whatever it is, you can hit the pause button and say, oh, this doesn't feel good. I don't like this. Let me hit the pause button. Let me slow down my heart rate, slow down my breath, slow down my brain waves. I'm going to get myself into a theta state and I'm going to choose what I want. I want to feel an elevated emotion of love, gratitude, appreciation, bliss, joy, and excitement. And then you embrace the image and you rehearse in, in the motion picture screen of your mind that which it is that you actually want. Moving on. But what what if instead of conditioning the body to the new mind of fear and anxiety, you experienced sustained elevated emotions and conditioned your body to the mind of love and coherence? Instead of being afraid and dreading that a panic attack is going to happen again, you'd get excited and look forward to the prospect of having an autonomic love attack. Oh yeah. So figure 7.3 shows three more examples of students who are able to sustain heart coherence for extended periods of time. If you look closely, you'll see their hearts are all responding to a consistent state of elevated emotions for at least 45 minutes. And that is their bodies are actually responding to a new mind. I'd say that's pretty supernatural. So now in figure 7.5a and 7.5b demonstrate two people with very poor heart rate variability. Now noted, with two sets of black arrows pointing upward in the natural waking state. So take a look at the changes in the heart rate variability when they practice heart coherence shown in the area between the gray arrows pointing inward. Even if it's only for eight to 15 minutes, these students are changing their biology. So heart coherence meditation. This meditation is based on the heart lock the heart lock-in technique developed by HMI. So this meditation is based on the heart lock-in technique developed by HMI. Close your eyes. Allow your body to relax and bring your attention to your heart. Start breathing in and out from the heart center and continue to do this more slowly and deeply. When your mind wanders, keep returning your attention and awareness to your chest, your heart, and your breath. Next, while you rest your attention in your fourth center, bring up some elevated emotions while continuing to breathe in and out of your heart center. 
Once you feel these heartfelt emotions in your chest area, send that energy out beyond your body and marry it with your intention. Continue to broadcast that energy and intention all around you. Start with 10 minutes and try to extend the practice and try to extend the time you practice it every day. In both figures, you can see two different students who have very little heart rate variability, demonstrated by the black arrows pointing upward. However, when it comes time to open their hearts, if you look between the two gray arrows, you will see a significant change. Even if it's just for 8 to 15 minutes, they are changing their physiology. So eventually, when you come to know what it feels like in your body to experience these elevated emotions, you can practice throughout your day with your eyes open. You'll learn more about how to do this in Chapter 9, the walking meditation. You might even set a reminder on your phone for four times a day. And when it goes off, take a minute or two to feel these elevated emotions. Okay, my friends, that concludes Chapter 7, Part 3. So I want to say to you, you can take that 10-minute heart coherence meditation that we just did a few minutes ago and practice that once, twice, three, four times a day. It's just 10 minutes. It's not very long. It's something that you will invest 10 minutes of time and it's going to pay you back in spades. One thing that I didn't realize when I started to get much deeper into meditation was that, you know, Albeit, I'm a person that doesn't require a lot of sleep. I've always been comfortable with five, six hours of sleep. But when you meditate, there's something for me that is so restorative about being in meditation. And I now understand, I didn't then, but now I understand that it, it makes so much sense to me. Because since you are connecting your heart to your brain, to your mind, you're talking to all of the cells in, uh, in your entire body. You're reconditioning your body to a new mind. You're getting your entire vibration of your body and your electromagnetic field is being fanned out and expanding the energetic waves. You are not only connecting with your own electromagnetic field within your heart and around your body and to the electromagnetic field of the earth and the electromagnetic field of others around you. It's all feeding you, but you're going inside, not outside to get this energy supply. So that is a very restorative energy. So I want you to think about if you choose to do this at bedtime, don't think that you're losing an hour, an hour and a half of sleep to this meditation. I want you to consider this hour, hour and a half that you're putting. If you go ahead and, and purchase Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditations, which is what I recommend that you do. If I were a doctor and I had a PhD and I were to say, I'm going to prescribe to you a meditation, I would say, go to Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditations um, and I would say, go to Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. And there's two meditations that are in there. Breaking, um, it's um, Water Rising Meditation and the Body Parts Meditation. Those are the two that make up that package. I can't remember. And I believe the price, the price is different than when I bought it. And so worth the money. Those are at about, about an hour and 20, an hour, hour and 19, hour and 30 minutes long each. And you're like, whoa, that's a long time. Consider it as part of your sleep time. Consider it as part of your sleep time. You're not taking time away from your sleep. That is the biggest mistake. And it's wrong thinking. You need to rearrange. You've got, it's tantamount to you're putting your sofa in front of your front door and you're not letting, you have great company. You have a VIP coming and you're not letting them in because you chose to put your sofa in front of your front door. How is that going to work for you? You say you, in, you invited this VIP to your home and instead of having your furniture all properly arranged in your house looking to the best, you put the sofa blocking the front door so even though they're knocking on the front door, they can't come in even though you invited them. 
You're sending a mixed signal here. Do yourself a favor. Take the sofa, put it, put it back in the living room where it belongs. Recognize that this is an hour and a half is included in your sleep. It's included in your body's restoration, in your body's health. It's going to restore your body, mind, soul, spirit, electromagnetic field. It is feeding you on so many dimensions, more dimensions than we will ever have time to talk about in this particular episode or probably any other. Because as, as we now know, as now I know, there is an infinite number of dimensions. There is an infinite number of densities that are in existence. And so recognize that this is an investment towards your health and well-being and in your sleep. And it will restore you. It will give you more energy. It will give you more life. It will heal you in multiple dimensions, multiple densities, multiple ways. And just be faithful to this work. You don't need to be faithful to anything outside. You need to, you need to be true to you. Be honest with you. Again, this is about you getting yourself right with yourself, getting to know you. This is the mastery of self. And it's the most beautiful, the most um, rewarding, the most complete, the most life-changing, the most transmutational, the most transfigurative, the most magical work that you will ever encounter. And once you start it, I don't think you will ever stop it especially once you get it going and you start to get the uh, results. In fact, I'm going to tell you um, one person that I would, there's two people I'm going to have you, in, I'm going to encourage you to connect to online. Morgan Bigelow. She has a YouTube channel. Um, I'll have to see if I can put, put her YouTube channel here. Hook up to her on Facebook. She is such a joyous soul. Every morning she puts these wonderful YouTube videos and there are so many insights and wonderful, just, it will just feed your soul is all I'm going to say. And she is on this wonder, wonderful journey with me and with you. Connect to her. Alexandra Cousins, who I interviewed recently. You can see her on my YouTube channel. There's an interview there. Dr. Joe testimonial with Alexandra Cousins. Phenomenal human being. Wow. 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 Not only she healed herself of all these mystery diseases, she moved multiple, you know, from multiple continents, from Italy to South Africa to Bali. She basically is living in paradise, living paradise on earth. It is an extraordinary uh, thing that she has created. And she has an incredible relationship with her spouse and her kids. It is just, it's what everyone wants. Incredible, beautiful soul. It will resonate in deep recesses of the parts which are in your soul that truth, that's where truth lies. And it's just going to resonate and it's going to feed your soul. Um, I'm not telling you that you need to tap into them every day, but I would highly encourage you to at least, at least you have a couple places you can go to where you can start to listen to people who are on this journey, who are farther along than you are. And then the third place I'm going to have you go is to my YouTube list where I have Dr. Joe Dispenza. In that playlist, there are countless testimonials of people sharing their experience. That's it. I'm going to end it right there. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and I am here to help you awaken your awareness of who you truly are, that focused awareness, that free will power, and how you too can become a master of yourself. Dream the impossible dream, my friend, because it is possible. Ciao for now.